Hi, my name is Jim Gilden. I'm a senior field editor at Sage Publications. One of the projects that I work on is our Sage Open Access products. And I'm here today talking about Open Access with Andrew Waller. And Andrew wears two hats in libraries and cultural resources at the University of Calgary. In the collections unit, he is licensing and negotiation librarian and is responsible for the acquisition of many electronic products, especially journals and databases. In the Center for Scholarly Communication, Andrew is open access librarian and mainly manages the Open Access Authors Fund. He regularly writes about and speaks on topics in both areas. Andrew has an MLS from the University of British Columbia. Andrew, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, thank you, Jim, for having me. Thank you to Sage as well. Our pleasure to have you. So why don't we take it from the top and just talk about what role the library plays in open access at the University of Calgary and just overall, and, and why does it play that role? The role kind of fell to us. I'll get back to that. Okay. How it manifests itself at the present is that we have a suite of open access related products and services. There's five of them, hopefully, that I can remember all five. I tend to remember four, then the fifth one. We use my head, it doesn't matter which one it is, but see if I can get all five down. First of all, there's the open access office fund, which is closest to me. I manage that on a day to day basis. It's designed to pay article processing charges, APCs, for some journals, some open access journals, of course, that use that model. There's criteria for the authors, there's criteria for the journal publishers, but basically that's what it does. In addition, we have an institutional repository, as many universities around the world do now. This has been in place since 2005. It's designed to collect the online scholarly output of the University of Calgary. Ostensibly, it's not an open access thing, but in practicality, it is. It's an open access tool, main tool on the green road of open access. Of course, the Open Access Authors Fund supports the gold road. We also have uh, digitization services. We've digitized a fair number of collections, around 40 or so. Uh, a wide variety of what they do, all of which are openly accessible, so we promote it in that way. We also have a journal hosting service. We host 21 journals, thereabouts, the number is correct. Some of these journals are open access, some of them are still total access. We're hoping in the future they might head in that direction. Some of those are open access. And then we also have the University of Calgary Press, been around for a long time. It chiefly deals with monographs. There are a large number of monographs that are available open access through the press. They generally use the pay for print, open access online is free. It's that sort of model. So those are five services that do support open access. It's for a variety of elements, some of the green and the gold in different ways. We ended up with it, with those services, with the role of dealing with open access and scholarly communication in general in many ways. Going back several years, libraries and cultural resources at the University of Calgary was, we always had interest in open access. We had a variety of units within it. It's not just the library, it was the archive, the press, special collections, Center for Scholarly Communication, so that's a more recent unit put together, a variety of other things. So there's always an interest there. We're always doing some things that, that sort of fell into scholarly communication. Mm -hmm. As open access became more of a growing concern, we essentially took on the mantle and, and started doing these programs and services or building them up in a more open access direction. To the point where we have this suite at present and we now are expected by others on campus, by university administration, we are expected that these sorts of services will be offered and that the university, uh, the largest council resources at the University of Calgary will deal with these sorts of topics. You talk about one of the things that you support are uh, journals. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, the support that you provide them and exactly what is it that the, <coughs> are these, you say some of them are still subscription, mm -hmm. um, are, some of them are open access. Yes. Do they charge fees to publish in these open access journals or they don't? That I'm not sure about. Okay. I don't know the details on the open access ones. 
I used to have a better idea about a year or so ago. Uh, the University of Calgary Press used to have a journal service, okay. a journal's element to their program, and uh, it's an advisory committee, and for those journals that are now just hosted by the University of Calgary, some of them used to be with the press, I used to know more of the details at that time. And again, it was a sort of a mix within the press. Some were subscriptions, some were open access. And that's sort of transferred to the journal hosting service, plus there's more that are there as well. So I'm not sure of the exact plans they use or programs they use to support themselves, but that, that brings up an interesting point in that there's a variety of them available for open access journals. ABC Malt gets a lot of press, we talk about it a lot. Mm -hmm. There's loads of journals that are funded by ABCs, but there's others that use other models out there. Well, right, some that are open access that don't charge anything. Anything, anything right? You, know, you pay for you, you pay for it get online free, or right. there's, a, there's a myriad of actually. It's a very long list. There's sure. all sorts of inventive ways that people are coming up with to help pay for open access. Right. And you were saying that the the university press and the library, so the library oversees the university press at Calgary. Yeah, the, the press director reports to the uh, vice provost and university library. Uh, the press is being a unit in the sort of library area for, for quite some time now. So as it most relationship, yeah. All right, yeah, some universities that work exactly. really well and others and it's yeah. really separate, different yeah. issues. Arms, but, length, or what have you, right? right. That's what we have, and it seems to work, I'd say, from my perspective. Right. So, what is what the process, we're talking about author processing or, or article processing charges, and I know you've had a fund at University of Calgary for many years now. What was the process for getting those funds set up aside for those author processing charges? Largely author warrant, author demand. Okay. There was always interest in scholarly communication issues and open access in particular within libraries and cultural resources. It's something we pay particular attention to. It came up usually in that almost a collections manner. Uh, that's where it sort of first bubbled up within libraries and cultural resources. So we'd always had an issue, but uh, always had an interest, but that interest grew elsewhere, grew elsewhere on campus um, with, particularly, yeah, we're talking at Sage thing here, but I mentioned another publisher, Biomed Central. Mm -hmm. There was a, and still is, a big interest in Biomed Central journals at the University of Calgary. People just twigged onto them for some reason right from the very beginning of that particular publisher. And at one point, the Biomed Central used a, just a flat fee model X amount of money for digital. It was around five thousand dollars for a year. It covered all the ABCs of the University of Calgary. Mm -hmm. That ended up getting paid out of library collections. In a sense, it was money that, if these weren't open access journals and were subscription journals, because of the demand, we would be subscribing to them anyway. So in that sense, it made sense. In that way, I should say, it made sense. Eventually, starting I think it was around two thousand and seven that territory, Biomed Central changed their model to one more like what they have now. You pay as you go along, you can do a prepaid membership with a discount that chops off some of the some of the money, makes it smaller. On that per ABC model, they set up some systems to uh, deal with, with large volumes, which is what we had at the University of Calgary, we still do. Uh, but it changed it. It made them, it ended up being a more expensive situation, and we dropped the membership for a while. Still, there was this demand on the part of the user community. Who's going to help with ABCs? Not all authors have uh, grant money or other such funds that they can do it, so they, they turn to us. And at the same time as well, if you think back several years, other publishers were coming in. Other new open access publishers, most publishers were starting to dip their feet into the open access water at some point. So we could see there was more demand happening beyond Biomed Central, and there was more coming that we would have to deal with in some way. So everything basically coalesced. The, Vice Provost and University Librarian said, all right, $100,000 and we created a fund at the beginning of uh, fiscal year 2008-2009. Actually started at the beginning of June. So those were all library funds or did the Vice Provost put up some funds there? Or was they, they're all library funds. Okay. Everything comes out of the library funds. We get it, 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 it comes from university administration. They task us to do some things that we get a fairly undifferentiated pot of money and then we things up from there. Just like what the way it works everywhere, sometimes the more labels go with the money. But uh, that's how it works in our shop. Talk to me a little bit about the amount of funds that you've had. Has it been increasing? Um, are you using it all? How many folks have taken advantage of it? Let's talk money first. We had, in the first four years, $100,000 
in the fund, hundred thousand dollars Canadian, which has been less than equal to and above hundred thousand dollars U.S. Uh, since the entire life of the fund. And basically, it averages out on par. That's for the first four years, hundred thousand dollars. Now, each year, the draw on the fund, the asks, the submissions, basically increase the amount the amount of money that we had in the fund. Part of me thinks that that's because I'm a fantastic manager. I'm sure. Uh, it may just be more luck, perhaps. After four years, we could tell things were changing. Uh, demand has always increased, but it was starting to increase a little more dramatically. And again, we could see more things on the horizon at that time. We could go back roughly two years or so, and more, even more publishers getting into open access, some getting into fairly big ways, more fully open access publishers, lots of changes going on, lots of things on the horizon. We knew that there'd be more demand. So we increased the fund that year to $150,000. A year ago, we mm -hmm. were in a similar situation. We realized that we were, it was increasing. That $150,000 was not going to last. I tried to do my best in terms of squeezing that money, getting the best deal for that money, making that money go as far as possible, but that wasn't going to happen. So in this particular year, this fund, the fiscal year is going in now, which would be 2013, 2014, we have about two hundred thousand dollars, maybe a little bit more, spent on that fund. Next year, we're not sure what's going to happen. That's a lot of money. There are lots of changes coming in the open access world. You know, more demand. We see definitely more demand. It's accelerating. It's locally, no two ways about it. There are more publishers out there. There's more publishers getting deeper into open access. We see other mandates coming from funders, particularly in Canada. All of that's going to affect things. So, what we're going to do about it? For the next fiscal year, which is just a couple of months or so away, we're not sure. We've started talking about the issues and the options. Where we end up, we'll see. And how do you, so, so what has the demand been, like in numbers of, of articles, and, and how do you limit that demand, or what sort of restrictions do you place on the, the requests that you get, if any? I crunched the numbers fully about a week and a half ago, two weeks ago. So be about two weeks ago. And at that point, in terms of articles that have fully gone through the process, basically we've done all, all or almost all the paperwork on those articles, we were at 492. Wow. That's sort of officially. Unofficially, we're way really beyond that. There's a whole bunch of that are sort of pending. I've started off the process working with the author, but they still have to fill in this form or get this invoice to me or do something with it. There's a fair number of that puts us well over 500. How, where we're going to end up at the end of this fiscal year, at March 31st, I'm not sure, but it'll do well as it falls to the 500. Again, it's, it's not going to, it's not going to decrease in the years to come, quite frankly. What is, so what's the process for an author who so wants to submit, he or she wants to submit an article to an open access publication and they want your support? What do, what do they do and how do you? Ideally, I like people to talk to me beforehand. Okay. Start them. Really, they should be thinking about publication and open access right at the beginning of a research project. Some do. That's increasingly happening. Mm -hmm. Doesn't always happen. Sometimes people will talk to me close to the end of a research project before they submit. Sometimes we'll talk about journals. Whenever tell people where they can publish, we'll look at options, what things cost, and processes and procedures. Quite often, though, they're fairly close to the end of the process when they talk to me. They may have already submitted the journal. In some cases, they've already had an accepted article. I'll work with anything. Uh, as early as possible is better, but I'll work at any point in the process. Sometimes people will call me. Sometimes they'll complete things a small, short form that people can fill in. Sometimes they'll just fill in that. There's a bit of communication back and forth. I have to assess it according to the journal credit, the criteria of the fund. We can talk about that later. Mm -hmm. And then they get a yay or nay. In most cases, they get an invoice from, assuming the answer is yes, they get an invoice from the publisher, they send it to me, I put it in the payment pipeline and the libraries and cultural resources pays it on their behalf. They don't need to worry about anything, the hassle is minimal. You can use a little as fill in one form, talk to me on a couple of emails or a phone call, send me an invoice to finish. Slightly different in the case of things like Hindawi and Biomed Central, we have different processes set up because the volume for those two is really big. But it essentially works out the same sort of thing. We do as much as we can automatically, as little decision making or investigation as possible. Take a quick decision, deal with it quickly. 
How involved are you in the process of, uh, I mean, you don't want to approve payments for journals that perhaps aren't as reputable as some, but how involved are you in the process of someone submitting a request for a particular journal that you're not familiar with? How do you vet that, or do you? Um, I, I do vet it part of the criteria. The journal criteria, basically, it needs to be a fully open access journal. That is, we can get everything in the content, mm -hmm. all the articles, all the elements of the issue in the journal. It's article issue journal, all those levels. If it's a hybrid journal, the publisher needs to be decreasing subscription costs in response to the take up of their hybrid open access program, or promise to do so in the next fiscal year. I should say subscription year. So it's fairly straightforward. Sometimes I know those things right off the bat, it's pretty obvious it's a fully open access journal. Other times you've got to do a bit of digging. In, in terms of, of, shall we say, less reputable open access journals, of which there are a fair number, mm -hmm. not that there's no shortage of unreputable subscription journals, too. Right. Um, that's an interesting question. I don't want to be telling people necessarily where they're published. So the line there that I, I may be fuzzy line, but I really don't want to cross it too mm -hmm. much. Most of the time, if they just say, I've got this thing, it's accepted, it's, it's all set, and it meets those criteria, we're all right with it. If someone asks me, however, I say, I've got this journal here, what do you know about it? Remember, you're, you're, you're pretty good in the open access world, have you heard about this? Tell me what you'll find. In that case, I'll send stuff there with me. Do some digging, I don't know anything about it. Is it on that, that uh, was on Beale's list? Is it not on Beale's list? Is it talked about in other ways? Is there any hubbub about it? Uh, anything on lists, anything on the web? What do I know about it personally? Has it crossed my path before? What's our experience in terms of bill payment with them, invoice payment with them? Uh, what's our experience from an acquisitions point of view? We've, we've gone in that direction at some point. What's the publisher like all around? Uh, what are my personal interactions? So I can draw from that, send it to the author, and then they can make up their own mind at that point. University of Calgary doesn't have an open access mandate. You sort of grown organically, it seems, uh, whereas some universities are, are doing mandates telling their faculty they want them to publish in open access journals wherever possible. Are, are you trying to move in the direction of an open access mandate at, at University of Calgary, or what, what's going on there with that? A mandate has been talked about. It's come up. It has come to fruition in a sense in one unit within libraries and cultural resources. Librarians, archivists, curators, we're all faculty members. Right? So we do publishing community work, committee work, all those sorts of things. We, basically two years ago now, I think, maybe even longer, uh, I'm trying to remember the date. Time passes, isn't it? If, at any rate, the last few years back, we got together at the equivalent of our faculty council and we unanimously voted to have an open access mandate for ourselves. So the fruits of our research, we committed to making them openly accessible. So you can go in our, our for instance, our institutional repository. I also put my stuff in ELIS, the subject repository for library and information science. You can find my presentations, articles, all sorts of odds and ends in there. We voted to do that ourselves. So that's a basically, though we're not officially a faculty, it's at that kind of a level. Which has kind of happened elsewhere as well. Some other campuses, there's no big mandate, but there's a faculty here or there that have done. That's the only mandate that exists now at the University of Calgary. There has been, as mentioned, some discussion about a larger mandate policy commitment, something along those lines. Uh, at, in 2012, at Open Access, the Open Access Week celebrations we had there, we had Dr. Richard Snyder from the University of California, San Francisco. They had just passed a mandate for themselves from that particular institution. And he was instrumental in that. This has passed a mandate for the entire UC system. Uh, he was part of that as well. And we were very pleased to have him up and talking about it. You know, great presentation, lots of attendees, lots of people who were interested. And there were a number of folks that came out of there that could have perhaps formed the basis of a committee. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the deputy provost at the time he looked like a good person to lead. If we're ever going to have a mandate, whereas the library should be definitely involved key element of it. I think it would be successful from what I've seen elsewhere to bring on faculty members from other units. It needs to be led by somebody outside the library. 
something at that point. It looked like we might have something, a program committee in place, but things changed. Uh, the gentleman in question went back to his teaching position, his research position, um, and it sort of stayed at that level since then. Nothing has moved too much forward since that time. Now, open access has bubbled up a bit at sort of the senior levels. There's the possibility in Canada of a dry funding agency mandate mm -hmm. coming into effect later this year. There were some discussions at our General Faculties Council, for instance, about this. It's on the Provo side. Maybe something will come out of that connected to some sort of mandate or policy or thing for the entire University of California. It'll be a while. These sorts of things take a lot of time to do. Even if there's huge amounts of people on site, even if there's massive support, it still takes time to do to work through the system. And if there's not massive support, if there's a variety of different opinions and thoughts out there, it takes a while to bring people on site. You go with something, from what I've seen in the places that have done it, what I've talked with, what I've read, when you're doing an institutional mandate, you have to do it right, to do it right, it takes some time. So if we're, if we're doing one in Calgary, it's in a very, very, very early stage. And uh, this is just me talking as well. It's, it's, there's nothing official even within libraries and cultural resources heading us in that direction. But the possibility exists. You're talking a little bit about faculty and, and getting faculty involved in open access. What are some of the common questions or concerns you get about open access from faculty? Or Pushback. That's a good question. Many of my questions are, that I receive are sort of centered on the fund. So they're interested to begin with. They've heard something, they found something, they know about the fund, someone's pointed them in this direction. A few years ago, I found that, that you know, found that the, uh, there's a lot of sort of lack of knowledge completely about open access. Maybe there's a little germ of something that they heard and nothing more. So if, if we were talking a few years ago, I'd say, yeah, I have to start from scratch almost. Just in the last year, let's say, things have changed. So the average faculty member knows something about it. They may not know everything about it. We might want them to know more, but they may have not too bad handle on green, but not so, not so, not so much about gold, or vice versa, or this element of gold and that element of green. So I'm filling in blanks here and there. In terms of sort of pushback, I don't run into too many people who are sort of ideologically against open access at a fairly general level. Find mostly people that have concerns and questions about how it gets implemented, how it gets done. There's plenty of examples out there, both at the University of Calgary and also elsewhere, on successful ways of implementing open access and dealing with that question, dealing with that issue. There's plenty of things we can draw on to, I think, lay those fears and show that open access is an opportunity mm -hmm. as opposed to something that people should be really worried about. And I found on a personal level, with not myself, but with other people, mostly, is it's um, open access is kind of like quitting smoking. I've never been a smoker. I've never quit. I have to quit, but I have almost respect for people who have gone through it because they've been through a lot. And when they quit smoking, sometimes you know, they're sort of grumpy ex-smokers. You know, they, they really would like to smoke again. They know they can't and they shouldn't, but they, 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 uh, they want to go back and smoke until something happens. They go for a run and they don't die. They're really great, they're really fantastic. Their kids will hug them. They taste some food that they have, that they ate for years, and all of a sudden it tastes different, it tastes better, and why did it taste like this? It's always tastes like this. But you smoked and it wouldn't taste like this. So something has to click. Once it happens with, with people who smoke, usually it's like, I'm not going back. This is fantastic, this tastes good, I go for a run, my kids will hug them. It's kind of the same thing with open access, I find. Let me draw an analogy. It takes until something clicks with them on a personal level. And then they're so, they realize this has been a success for me. I put my article in the institutional repository, and I can see that it's downloaded X number of times from a wide variety of places, and I'm getting more phone calls and interest as a result of this. I made my article openly accessible in a journal, and I, the citations went through the roof, downloads went through the roof, my world has changed. Usually it's something like that, something they can twig onto. It gives them that level of satisfaction, reward, and success, either using old style of parameters, or in our new world, new ways of looking at articles and journals and measuring things, or success is that matter. 
but enough that says to them as a faculty member, this is good, this has worked for me, I'm gonna carry on. And that's what they tend to do. We've got repeat users. Article number one worked great for them. Help fund your APC, and they want more like it. Andrew, thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you. It.